Welcome to Instagram Live at Manfredi Jewels. This is episode four, and we are having as our special guest today, uh, and they're ready to join, Joe Kirk. Here he's going to be joining. He's connecting, and there he is. Hi, Rob. Hello. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. It's great to have you um, from the Grand Seiko USA Instagram official account, which is fantastic. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I want to welcome Joe Kirk has a very unique title in our industry. <laughs> very so, Sorry, say again? I said very long also. Yes, it is very long. So <laughs> Joe is the Grand Seiko brand curator and national training manager <laughs> so he does have a long title and uh it's a very unique position in the industry i don't know of any anybody else in the industry who has uh sort of two positions uh doing what you do so let us know how you came to grand seiko and how you came to be in this unique position that is i think uh novel in the industry yeah well um you know i, I started uh, in, in retail in 2005 and, you know, worked my way through there for maybe a little over 11 years. And uh, one of the stores uh, that was selling Grand Seiko when they first came to the U.S. fell in love with the brand. It's, uh, it's, it's an easy thing to do. And then there, um, did some kind of like freelance uh, writing and web design and stuff like that. And then I joined uh, Seiko Corporation of America back in 2016 uh, as a director of the new, newly opened at the time Miami Boutique. And uh, once Grand Seiko Corporation of America was started in 2018, I joined the team here, moved from Miami to Jersey. So uh, since then, I have been on the road a lot, not uh, obviously much, uh, recent, but um, that's kind of how I, how I really, I mean, if uh, you have anyone Team. I'm just, you know, my title really should just be Watch Nerd. <laughs> and uh... great, uh, you know, Joe, your 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 cutting in and out is a little bit with your your audio. Is um, is your, your internet connection good? Seems like it. I have uh, I have full reception. It seems okay. All right, there you go. That was good. Maybe it's just the beginning connection, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's really exciting. And and how fun is it? You know, being a, a Watch Nerd. Uh, having your career be something that you love and, um, you know, you can continue to learn about, which is really great. So tell us, what are your responsibilities in this unique position? Tell me is what it is that you do. You know, um, really, I, I, I just get to do what I love. I talk about Grand Seiko. I mean, realistically, that's, that's my job is to talk about Grand Seiko, and it's awesome. Um, I mean, I, I uh, travel to, to all of our uh, partners like yourself. I've been uh, you know, visited Manfredi, uh, at least, I think, been there at least once uh, so far. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but the, uh, again, the position really has only been over the course of the last year and some change. So, and with a, several months, no travel whatsoever. Um, so, uh, I, I train everyone about grant in terms of sales, uh, work a little bit with our marketing department, uh, you know, so I kind of overlap a little bit of those sides. Uh, involved a lot of events. Uh, that's really good. more heavily involved in events and anywhere I can kind of go and talk about kind of what I do. And like I said, you know, it's something uh, I greatly enjoy. Of course. Yeah, that's that's fun. Um, yeah, I can think about the first time that you and I met. And that was a pretty special experience because <laughs> that was the party that, so Grand Seiko held through a big event in New York City to commemorate when <clears throat> Grand Seiko themselves separated from Seiko and it's its own independent company in the United States, which, which was amazing. And uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. And there were two special things that happened that night. Uh, number one, uh, at long last, I was waiting uh, for a watch that had been announced. I never saw it in person before, but when I saw it, I said, I have to order one for myself. There is no question. And that is the SBGA 387, the Kirizuri dial, which is a US limited edition. Uh, incredibly beautiful watch. So I, I 
took delivery of this watch that night. So that was special. And also, um, also, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sized it for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how great. we sized your watch. That's yes. But um, and, and another special thing that we got to do is uh, so before I got into this industry, uh, I was a professional opera singer. I still sing. And so um, I was invited by Mr. Atori the president of Seiko Corporation worldwide. He is also a singer and he performed and him and I performed a duet uh, at the party that night. And uh, it was a lot of fun and an incredibly memorable experience. So uh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of great, great stuff that evening. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. It was awesome. Um, and so uh, we've been a Grand Seiko dealer from close to the beginning. Uh, and, you know, it's... Um, it's amazing the the level of integrity and uh, what a great team that you guys have from the top down from you to uh, the representatives of the brand in the corporate office. Everybody that I've dealt with um, is really makes makes doing business with you guys really fantastic. Um, and I have to say, you know, one of the when we did the training with you, that was one of the best trainings that we've had. And I think it's great because you have a retail background. And you know a lot about the industry. You're able to sort of paint a picture as to where Grand Seiko sits within the industry. Um, and so it, to this day, it's one of those, one of the best trainings that we've had here at the store. So again, thank you for that. Generous of you to say. <laughs> well, and, and I can understand. I mean, I understand that you have um, uh, a young child at home, uh, right? How old is it? It's your son, right? And a half. So you know, <laughs> in the back, hopefully, uh, hopefully not. So we'll, we'll try our best. But, but um, you know, I appreciate all the traveling that you do and how challenging it must be in this industry and, and to do that traveling and balancing work, life, and home uh, and doing it at the excellent level that you do. So uh, kudos to you. <laughs> appreciate it. Kudos to you guys. I mean, you, you and your team are amazing. Uh, you know, I, I, I really come back to your store more often. Great time there. And, uh, you know, I heard to, you know, well, in general, going back to normal, but uh, especially to come you guys it'll be it'll be a lot of fun yeah for sure and there's there's a lot to talk about uh coming up um we have a question here somebody's asking is grand skate coming to russia i believe we do have a small distribution network in russia already uh right. where exactly i don't know yet so um that's something that uh you can check on the grand Seiko official website where I, uh, a lot of a lot of territory with very but um, you know, there we have a presence there right now. Great, great. Uh, and of course, there is the question. Uh, somebody's just asking, "How about Ireland? Ireland? Do we have any in Ireland?" We have distribution in, in Ireland as well. Yeah. Great, great. So, if anybody wants to ask a question during this live, there is the little question box that is on. So you can click on that, and you can ask a question. And we're going to do questions at the end, uh, towards the end of the hour. So. Um, <clears throat> Joe, if you could give us a little brief history about Grand Seiko for those who are not as well versed in the brand and might not understand or know enough. Tell us a little bit about the history of Grand Seiko. I'll start off by uh, a little bit of history on Grand Seiko is a very hard thing, especially for me to do, and you are well aware. <laughs> um, I can talk for hours on end. But uh, to, to sum it up very quickly, you know, Seiko Show, right, uh, back, you know, back in uh, – it, well, it started kind of in like the uh, 1930s, 1937. They opened with the Seiko Show. It was the first like wristwatch uh, dedicated for Korean company Seiko. And so they opened that factory. And then uh, in the 40s, uh, uh, branch of that in the Sua region. And those two manufacturers uh, eventually kind of had a split. And ended up having this little rivalry going. And that led to the birth of Grand Seiko. Who can make the best, you know, the best possible practical watch? Um, Grand Seiko was launched by Seiko Show in 1960. Made to be the pinnacle product, right? The highest accuracy possible. But again, very practical, very easy to read. Built to be very long last, very comfortable and to, to maintain. So in that state, and this, uh, there's, there's uh, such a deep history with Grand Seiko, and there's so much I can talk about. Um, one of the things that I, I like to that even though Sue started uh, making the first Grand Seiko, it was really by 
uh, about 1966, we launched what we called Grand Seiko Stand, which meant that Grand Seiko at the time switched from essentially being chronometer level accurate, which was the high level of accuracy in international uh, standards. So they switched to the Grand Seiko standard, which was a big step above. And from that point on, everything was made to be more accurate than the chronometer. So in 1967 is when Daini Sekusha and Sua Sekusha both started to make Grand Seiko. And, uh, you know, the the first Sekusha was the 44G, probably the most iconic SBGA 387. Uh, the 44G design or the modern at least of that, it, uh, the iconic look of it. And then uh, the 2 gs as an example, was the automatic, uh, the first automatic Grand Seiko influenced the Japan C collection uh, that we introduced in 19. So you see, you see a little bit of DNA from Grand Seiko uh, start from 1960 all the way through today. You know, a lot of the stylistic uh, aspects of it or retain more or less, you know. It's important to recognize the the wonderful things of the past, but always to kind of pave a new path and, you know, think about the future. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd say that kind of sums up Grand Seiko and always reaching for the top, always striving to, to kind of outdo ourselves and to, uh, you know, not too far away from our path, but embrace the future. Nice, nice. And so, <clears throat> uh, on the back of that history, um, I asked you to prepare five things about Grand Seiko that you feel are important that the watch public may not know, and what things set Grand Seiko apart from from other brands. Because we all know there's a lot of watch brands out there. Here at Manfredi, we carry over 30 different brands, uh, and there are definitely some things that are very specifically Swiss that that we know but grand seiko is different so can you enlighten us to these at least five things of uh that set grand seiko apart and that you feel that the public should know that they may not know yeah absolutely i'm i'm very happy to do that i could of course and ramble about more than uh, real quick i wanted to, to answer this uh, this question has the sbg v205 been you and uh it's essentially like by the sbg p001 so it's the same 44GS design, the modern interpretation uh, with the chandelier dial. It's just now it has the feature where you can adjust the power hand in it, so, which was not available on the B-series. So the um, onto the five things, right? Okay. First and foremost, I, uh, I, I think that one thing that a lot of people don't realize that what really makes Grand Seiko Seiko and kind of unique in the industry um, is, is the pride of the hometowns, right? When you look at Grand Seiko, you're looking at, you know, whether it's a snowflake with, with a dial that's made to resemble the texture of the snow and in New York, they make the watches. Uh, or if you're talking about the latte dial like I'm wearing on my SBGJ203, um, you know, it's always a connection between Grand Seiko watches and the of the watchmakers. So I think that's it's really cool and really industry and it kind of, myself included, uh, feel closer to, to the craftsmen and women of the studios. You know, yeah. uh, you know they, they should have a lot to be proud of, very, uh, you know, modest, of course. But, you know, I mean, there's there's really nothing beautiful in my eyes uh, than this, you know, kind of symbolism of their... Of, of their... Two, I would say, Probably one of uh, it, it kind of addresses a, a question of why doesn't Grand Seiko make watches, and um, you're starting to see that more now, more manual line movement. Uh, you know, uh, we just launched two automatic movements for both spring drive and high beat that are thinner than generations. Um, but in reality, uh, the reason why a lot of our movements end up, uh, or cases end up a little bit on the thicker side is is one. Uh, part of tolerances of design and kind of, if you look at the sides of Grand Seiko, very dramatic outward, outward angles, and you need the space, you need the tolerances. Uh, also the automatic movements uh, compared to the past, which were most manual line, 
are, are going to be thicker in general. But we make the bridge bills and everything quite uh, thick and robust. Joe, Joe, you know what? We've had a, a complaint about the audio, and you are kind of breaking up. So what I would suggest is maybe can you can you leave and rejoin us, and maybe we'll see if we get a better connection because we're losing like a couple of every five words we're losing one word. So let's try if you if you disconnect and then reconnect. Let me get a shot? The stand. Maybe it's a stand that I have this uh, phone on. Can you hear better now? No, no. It's just like every five words we're losing a word. I apologize for the, the, the audience. Yeah, I apologize. So bear with me. I'll, I'll uh, jump off and jump right back on. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Joe is off. Now we're going to have him rejoin us in a moment. Uh, there we go. There he is. We're going to add and... We'll get Joe back. Thank you for all bearing with us, but uh, it's important to hear what he's saying. It's important stuff, so just waiting for him to join us again. And thank you all for joining us here today. Um, and I see some questions in the question box, so we're going to get to those at the end and keep adding any questions that you have. Um, uh, what mechanism do Grand Seiko watches use? Ah, here he is. He's back. Let's see. All right. So I also grabbed a different stand. So hopefully it's not as muffled or cutting. No, out. it wasn't muffled. It was just a bad connection. You sound great now. Okay. Good. Great. Cool. Sorry about okay. that. No worries. <laughs> Excellent. So anyway, we were at on um, uh, the second reason you were sharing with us to sort of set Grand Seiko apart. Yeah. Um, biggest concern in terms of making in this the the movements uh, you know really robust, durable, and energy efficient. You know, our, our bridges end up thicker, our components end up thicker. We want them to last uh, multiple lifetimes. So that's a big part of the engineering aspect of movements is to make them thicker so they last longer and, they're, and they work better and they're more shock resistant. So that's always something to keep in mind. However, we're engineering new ways to reduce the overall thickness, as you saw in our, our uh, newer manual wind caliber. Uh, by, you know, having manual wind, I, you know, it takes a takes a good chunk off the thickness. But um, same with our automatics. You look at the new spring drive professional grade diver that we have coming out. Mm -hmm. this, this movement is a whole millimeter thinner than the previous generation. It has a five day power reserve instead of three. It's more accurate than the previous generation of spring drive. Yet the robustness, the rigidity of it has actually been increased. Wow. So, you know, this is something that is very, very serious for Grand Seiko. It's a part of our DNA to make these very long-lasting and very durable movements. And you, I, I have a feeling you'll never see, I can't say for sure, um, but I have a feeling you'll never see an, a, a true ultra-thin caliber in Grand Seiko because it just doesn't, it, it doesn't fit the philosophy. Mm. But uh, I could be wrong. Who knows? Maybe they'll come up with something really, really durable and, and accurate that's ultra-thin. They, they don't ever stop uh, innovating at the manufacturer. So this is uh, one thing to keep in mind as well. So that would yeah. be innovation is key, right? Mm -hmm. Spring drive is a perfect testament of that. Spring oh, drive yeah. has, uh, you know, nearly 30 years of development under its belt uh, before it was brought to a true, like, uh, commercial stand. From, the, from a commercial perspective, you know, it wasn't really a sellable product uh, or, or a profitable product for that matter until at least about 2005. So mm -hmm. starting development in 1977. So that, that tells you something very dedicated. Yeah. Uh, but this year was a, another big stride in that, in that effort in uh, launching a newly designed statement, uh, you know, for high beat. So this is something that, uh, you know, the Grand Seiko is very serious about it's making sure innovation is always key. And it's not just spring drive mechanical and also quartz you know this year we launched a quartz caliber that has an independent adjust hour hand and people don't realize how much effort went into that so that will lead me into number four mm -hmm. <laughs> don't think that quartz is something to look past because the effort that and time and quality that goes into grand seiko quartz not just counting the accuracy we're talking about 10 seconds a year accuracy, sometimes five uh, if it's limited edition. We, yep. you know, we have a great accuracy standard for our courts. However, 
dur from a durability and longevity perspective. And this is uh, one, of, one of the biggest selling points uh, that I talk about in mm -hmm. F Quartz is our Quartz is built to last multiple generations, right? This is not a Quartz movement. Like most Quartz movements in the world, if there's any kind of internal problem with it aside from the battery, they're typically discarded and a new one's put in because it's cheaper, yep. it's cost effective, it's more, less work for the watchmaker. But with 9F Quartz, these are service movements. And they're, you know, these movements have, you know, generally starting around uh, 140 components. So in this new uh, 9F85 caliber that we introduced this year is even more so because of the independent adjust hour hand. And yeah. that independent adjust hour hand was something we've wanted to do for over a couple of decades at, at Grand Seiko. And the reason it took us so long to introduce this feature is because of the instantaneous date, right? 9F Quartz is the only quartz watch in the world that was introduced with an instantaneous date. It's fully mechanical. It would work just as it would in a mechanical watch. However, if we had a jumping hour hand previously, it would have interfered with that instantaneous date. And the, the way you change the date is by jumping the hour hand. So there would have been a tremendous amount of wear on jumping spring. And so the big innovation lied within the actual durability of, of so there's a, you know, a lot of research and development that went into the launch of, uh, not just the 9F85, but also the 9F86 introduced in 2018 GMP. So mm -hmm. what we have here, uh, this, this new SBG P015 is awesome. Uh, it's got the tough quartz case design is, um, yeah, yeah. And the, the there's the one. Yep. So the 39 millimeter GMT, 39 millimeters includes the crown protector too. So it wears a little bit smaller with the functional bezel. You know, that's a great piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely one of my favorites that we have here, and we'll 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 get to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I liked Mr. Grand Seiko who's watching us. Uh, he commented. He said, "Quartz for the mechanical watch guy," and uh, I would wholeheartedly agree with that statement for sure thank you <laughs> and uh number five so number five is um is really i think when it comes down to grand seiko to not forget that everything is built with form and function right so the way that we do the the hands and the markers the multifaceted aspect of the hands and markers right it's beautiful. It makes them glimmer like a diamond, but this is something that is functional. And in reality, it's all about light and shadow, right? Co heavy contrast to increase visibility and legibility. So even when you look at the top surface of the hands, right? In this instance, on the darker dial, generally the darker dials will have hairline uh, or uh, a brush finishing on, on the top of the hands while it's all mirror on the sides. But everything has a reason. And with Grand Seiko, I mean, it's uh, almost anything can be explained. So it's, um, you know, there's always kind of like a, a functionality aspect that's implemented in the overall design. You know, a lot of people ask why our professional diver is so big, uh, 600 meter water resistance, but it's 47 millimeters almost. And yeah, there we go. So the new uh, SLGA-01 limited edition of 700 pieces it, and it measures at 47 millimeters, but, uh, and, and about 16 millimeters. In, but it's 600 meters water resistance with no helium escape. So the, the construction of the case is incredibly elaborate. I mean, the crystal on this thing is probably over six millimeters in, in thickness itself. So that adds quite a bit of, of to this watch. However, when you put it on the wrist, doesn't wear bad at all. And that's because the lugs are super short, right? 50 mm. millimeters lug to lug length. And pretty much, you know, it, everyone has a preference in width and thick. I, I understand that, but uh, you know, built for functionality, of course. It doesn't look terrible. I mean, I have a seven inch wrist and, and uh, I thought it looked great. I would wear it just as an everyday watch. I'm not a diver, you know? <laughs> and right. people who, die, who own dive watches probably not, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I would agree with, with with that. And I think for a lot of these watches, you know, you can't just go by spec. 
you actually have to get it on the wrist, see it in the metal and see how it feels and fits and wears. And that's one of the things that, you know, these watches that even at a 45 millimeter from, from Grand Seiko, they wear really comfortably and really well. Yeah, that's uh, another big question about our divers. We have the 200 uh, meter spring drives, right? That are listed mm -hmm. 44 on, on the website. And I, what I find interesting about that is that includes the crown protector. You have to keep wow. that in mind. So if you execute right. the crown protector, the the width of the watch, the diameter of the watch is only 41 and some change. It's like 41.2. So it's, wow. it, it's amazing that, you know, I, I understand the spec makes it seem quite large at 44. Right. Put it on the wrist. It doesn't feel like that. And that's because it's really because that 44 is including the crown protector. So, sure. And I, yeah, I think, you know, if there's, there are people out there who are interested in the specific model, but then they read the specs and they go, oh, that's too big for me. I can never wear a 44 millimeter watch before you completely rule it out is come to an authorized retailer and get a sense of the watch on your wrist because you might be surprised. Yeah, it's, I mean, you have to try them on. All right, for sure. Well, that's awesome. Uh, those are really enlightening facts and important for us. Uh, and I see a lot of people uh, joining in and having some great comments. So obviously you are around this all day long, uh, day in and day out, you've been to Japan and you know the line in and out. So I wanna know what are your favorites from the current collection uh, and why? Oh, there's so many. I know, we gotta, <laughs> and I'm gonna share mine. So we only have, right, we're, we're, we're about halfway through, we only have an hour for this. So I know we could, we could keep going on and on. So why don't, why don't you just give me a few and then I'll, I have a tray full of watches here that I wanna share. All right, so um, I, I'll start with where I started, Snowflake. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a question. The Snowflake became uh, the dominant force of my collection. I think at the time when I purchased it, uh, it was about 2012. And, you know, this is back when it still said Seiko Grand Seiko on the dial. And so I bought the Snowflake around 2012, and I wore it, like, nonstop for basically, like, seven years. Mm -hmm. And look at my watch. You can tell that I abused it, right? It just uh, <laughs> lots of light brush scratches. Thankfully, no like nicks or dents or anything. Right. Um, so I'll have it refinished. Uh, you know, uh, with Zeratsu one day, I'll have to send it back to Japan. But the Snowflake, I, I mean, is just uh, you know, it really connected me to the brand, mm -hmm. and uh, I will I will never forget that. And next, uh, the only other watch I'd say. That Really connected in the same way is the high BMC, so the SBGJ203. Mm -hmm. And what's funny about this watch is I actually own this in the 203 with the Grand Seiko only dial. I also own with the Seiko Grand Seiko dial the 003. So I own this watch twice. <laughs> tell you how much I love it. And Very nice. You can ask most people. You know, if you see me, I'm, I've generally got this watch on and. Mm -hmm. uh, and another one probably at the same time which is a spring drive um and more recently i've picked up the uh chronograph the mm -hmm. egc 203 i i've had a little over a year now um it, you know everyone's intimidated by the pushers because they're big they're super functional it's an amazing feel and uh you know I, I should actually probably have it nearby but we'll uh we'll have to go without the visual aid. but the way it wears, I'm on the computer a lot, and I don't have the problem with the pushers or the crown digging into my wrist, and that's, I mean, that's amazing. So that's kind of my sports watch. I don't own a lot of chronograph or anything like that, but mm -hmm. I love that one, just based on the complexity of it. And uh, all three of these watches that I've mentioned to you uh, thus far, um, I was influenced to buy a watchmaker from the studios. So <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's... You, know, you see what the what the kings of Grand Seiko are wearing, and you kind of want to have it. So, makes sense, totally. Well, um, I'll give you a little overview of some things because uh, there, of course, there's a lot uh, a lot to talk about. Obviously, my favorite uh, piece, but this is a limited edition; you cannot get it anymore. Is the SBGA 387? This is the first U.S. only limited edition for Grand Seiko. It's the Kirazuri dial, and I think this encapsulates. Uh, some of the things that really make Grand Seiko special. The 44GS case, the modern reinterpretation of that, uh, 
the lines and the angles. Uh, it's spring drive and also it has a special dial. Those are three things I think that set Grand Seiko apart from other brands and really have, you know, that, that real Japanese identity and really say Grand Seiko. So that is, that is one, but um, in, that's not current collection, but I'm going to give you the things here that we have in the current collection. So uh, number one, the limited edition for the 60th anniversary, the SBGH 281. This is also known as the Superman. Uh, and the dial is stunningly, I'm red, uh, red and blue are my two favorite colors. So this watch really speaks to me. It's again, it's the high beat. So those are the two special movements for me that set Grand Seiko apart, spring drive and high beat. And this is the 44 GS case again, and the special dial. And somebody might say, well, it's just a blue dial, but it's not. If you see this in person, the depth and the lacquer, um, do you, did they explain to you, is this a special process or something? Because there's definitely, this is not your everyday dial. This is a very special dial. Can you tell us about the dial, Joe? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the sunray finishing that we do for this dial um, is, is quite special. And that's one of the beautiful things about this. You know, we're doing this, uh, this Grand Seiko blue uh, is kind of our signature color. And you know that from dealing with the brand for as long as you have. Mm -hmm. Know, and that all roots to uh, you know, the indigo dyeing in ancient Japan, very labor intensive, very hard, but very um, special, very like regal. You know, this is a very important color. And so we wanted to kind of match that, but also it's always important to have light and shadow. And so the sunray finishing really captures the, the brightness of the blue and the, and the darkness of the darkest shadow. Um, what's really cool attribute of this watch, and I'm actually not the one who discovered this. Uh, I, I didn't find out about it till later, so I'll, uh, I'll send a shout out to my friend uh, Roland, our West Coast, uh, our Western half of the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. for the brand. He noticed, uh, seeing it for the first time live in, in the store, that the Sunray patterning actually comes out from the GS logo, not from the center of the dial, as uh, almost all of our other do. So. Mm -hmm. And that's in that's of course uh, yep. Shout out to Roland, gotta love. Wow. So uh, he discovered that, and that's of course a, a tribute to this 60th anniversary. Which uh, the 60th anniversary is uh, you know it's a special you know time in Japan. Obviously, uh, you know we said in our press releases you know 60 is a very significant number in horology. Mm -hmm. Of course, 60 minutes, 60 seconds. But uh, also in Japan, they celebrate what's called Konreki, which is the celebration of rebirth or a new horizon right because you've completed a full zodiac cycle at, at 60 so okay that, that's really the the cool thing about it is it's, it's expressing this new horizon and you can kind of see that the the light is coming from the golden gs in this particular model wow that's well thank you roland thank you for sharing that with us because it's something that i didn't notice and it's a really great thing to point out it makes it special so the next one is the s BGP015, which is also a 60th anniversary piece, but this is the quartz version uh, with that same blue dial, but this one has a blue ceramic bezel. Uh, here are some better photos of it. Um, and again, you can see it's really special and the price point is fantastic on this. It's $3,800. And this is a unique case that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Prior to this model, there was only another limited edition that came in two versions, but only on a strap, never on a bracelet. And it was, uh, there was a, a, like a silver dial and there was a black dial. Um, and I know that this is, was something that people who, uh, you know, they, they were looking for that watch uh, well, after it, well after it sold out. And it was a quartz watch, but it's a really unique, uh, sporty uh, style case. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of nicknamed the Tough Quartz uh, in Japan. So the previous models on the straps were Japan only. They were Japanese domestic models. So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of interesting. We, we did get a small allocation in the U.S. And then those models were discontinued. So it was yes. very short lived. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I shouldn't mention this, but I ended up getting one of those for my collection. It was also one of my other favorite Grand Seikos. Um, nice. Cool quartz. But, you know, sadly, I like the newer movement and it doesn't have the, the newer movement. So that's one of the downsides of the previous gen. So mm -hmm. they come on the Cordura, the ballistic nylon strap, and, uh, you know, this tough quartz case design, actually very reminiscent of our professional fiber in terms of the lug design. Mm -hmm. uh, the faceting is just amazing. Uh, you know, everything 
mirror surface is just interacting with light and shadow in essentially opposite ways. So if there's shadow on one side, there's light. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I love that about it. Um, the ceramic bezel, right? This is something that everyone was hoping to see in Grand Seiko for a long time. And yeah. We, we never applied it to our dive watches. And then part mm -hmm. of the reason behind that was the insert for, you know, because you need to have a metal bezel base, but the insert, you know, concerned about the uh, thickness of the ceramic and how durable it was. Mm -hmm. Since you have the thicker ceramic for the full bezel, it's actually the crystals elevated above the above the ceramic as well. So it's well protected. And that's mm. important in terms of this design and one of the reasons why we're doing uh, you know, ceramic in this instance. Nice. Nice. Well, um, I have more here. Uh, as we showed before, this is the SBGN005, which is the 39 millimeter quartz GMT. I think this is a fantastic travel watch, although we're not traveling very much these days. But uh, what's great about this is there's really not a lot of sporty 39 millimeter watches on the market. There's only a handful. And so I think this is really great because the size is fantastic for me. I have a six and three quarter inch wrist. Uh, it's very comfortable. And that's what you want in a travel watch. Uh, and of course, quartz, you don't have to worry about winding and all of that. So this is this is a fantastic piece. Um, <clears throat> we'll move along now. Of course, the SPGA 387 Kirazuri dial is a sold out limited edition, but that same watch is available in uh, without the special dial, which these are great dials. So there's the champagne dial and there's also a basic blue dial of this watch. Uh, and that's the SPGA 373. And then the blue dial version is the, is it 375 or is it? Got it. Right, exactly. So there's two other versions, same watch, uh, except for the fact that it doesn't have the special Curazuri dial, but it has the spring drive, it has the 44 GS case, really, uh, really fantastic. And the price point is $5,200, so awesome. Uh -huh. um, two more uh, of my favorites, and that they are from the Seasons Collection, which is very special because it is a U.S. only edition. Uh, so these are only sold in the U.S., and there's four of them for the Seasons. Uh, my two favorites are perfect for right now is the summer and this, hold on, let me, let me get out of this uh, photo here. So you guys can see, here we go. The summer. So this is a really beautiful green dial uh, and there's a great texture to it. And uh, I learned about the seasons, how in Japan each season is divided into three mini seasons, which is very interesting. And so this is the summer and there's a texture on the dial and Joe, Tell us what exactly there was some significance to the texture and the green color for this specific season. Yes. Yeah, so um, with the with the seasons, each one's inspired by one of uh, the 24 seasons of Japan. And this particular season is Rika. So Rika is the uh, beginning of summer, right? This is when everything starts to come to life, starts getting really rich and green. And uh, golden accents obviously pay tribute to that uh, summertime sun. The interesting thing about this watch, when you look really, really close, mm -hmm. dial, right, you get it under a loop or some really strong magnification. I mean, it looks kind of like rice paper. And there's, uh, when you take a step back from it, you can see this kind of vertical line uh, in the dial. Mm -hmm. And while this isn't a part of, uh, you know, conceptually of the watch, it reminds me actually of the city of Morioka where they make mm -hmm. watches. If you ever have the opportunity, I know you uh, you have, but you ever have the opportunity to uh, to go to Japan and go to Morio, right? When you go to the Grand Seiko manufacturer, mm -hmm. buy tons of rice fields, and those rice fields are especially in the beginning of the summer, very very heavily green, but the tips are golden. And so every time I look at the Rika, I think of the same thing, which is driving into the manufacturer and seeing wow. a beautiful, uh, it's just green and gold, you know, kind of as far as your eyes can see, at least until you see Mount Iwate, which is uh, a little more on the gray side. But wow. This, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a cool aspect of the watch that maybe isn't a part of the concept, but I see it. So nice. Nice. Awesome. And last but not least, uh, a perennial in-demand uh, favorite uh, since it was released, and that is the Spring, which is the SBGA413. And it's kind of hard to see here, but the dial is a pale pink, uh, and it's titanium. 
So it's super light and it is a spring drive. So uh, this is really uh, a really another one of those things because this case, this watch case is unique to the Seasons collection. And I know there's some historical significance to the case. And so it has those, again, those elements that set it apart from other watches. So if you're only going to one, own maybe one Grand Seiko, but you would not only just want to own one, you would want to own many as you get deeper into the brand. That being said, though, what you have here are those interesting little things that really make it special. And if you own all Swiss watches, then this is something that you might want to add to your collection because it has those elements of the really special dial with that texturing, the spring drive, the fact that it's titanium is also a benefit and this special case. Joe, can you tell us about the watch case? Yeah, so the case is inspired by a 1967 model uh, similar to the, the 44 GS, which came out in 1967. Uh, this one called the 62 GS, which was the first automatic Grand Seiko. And so the, the 62 GS was really, uh, I mean, it was such a cool model because it was still very flat and very faceted, similar uh, in, in some regard to the 44. Or GS, at least the flatness and, and uh, the sharpness of it. But in reality, the lugs are much thinner, uh, very different design. And the thing about it was back then, you know, people wanted really, really thin watches. Auto being automatic made it really tall. So in order to kind of mask the height of the vintage model, they eliminated the bezel. So instead of being like case back, middle case, and then bezel, it's just case back and case. And then the crystal is directly attached to what would typically be the mid case. And so that's still implemented in the modern reinterpretation. Mm. Dramatic change aside from the size is that the crown used to be in the four o'clock position on the vintage model, mm -hmm. signifying that it was automatic, right? You don't need to manually wind it. Right. right. On the older model, you couldn't manually wind it anyways. So the crown was only to set the time. And uh, what's interesting with these you can, manu you can manually wind it, it's automatic, so the crown is now in the three o'clock. Um, you know, functionality, of course, you know, important. Um, one big advancement, I would say, though, on the, the, the vintage style is when you mm -hmm. look at the sides of the vintage, it's pretty straight cut, you know, mm -hmm. flat downward, where these new models are, are quite a bit more faceted. So that's a, a, a nice uh, add-on from, from the designer, Mr. Kubo, uh, who's renowned designer for the company, who's also designed like the Snowflake and, you know, many, many Grand Seiko. Right. You know. Nice. If, nice. I, if I said he designed the Snowflake, everyone should be, uh, should be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, moving along, um, new releases. So let's talk about two new releases. Number one, uh, you, you had a great re uh, I release party and you hosted uh, along with some collectors and of course, uh, Brees, uh, the president of Grand Seiko USA, who did a fantastic job. And it was it was a really enjoyable evening with you guys as you introduced the the new um, Soko special editions, which uh, there we are, there they are. Um, so tell us just a, a little bit of an overview about about these watches, which we just received, we have them here in the store. Uh, I believe one was pre-sold, so I think we have the silver dial. I believe we still have available. But but tell us quickly about those. So the show is, uh, is is continuing on twenty four seasons of Japan, except instead of doing you know four different micro seasons, we'll call them or seki is what they're called in Japanese. Uh, in this case, we have two models for one micro season. So and with that, we're kind of. Uh, we were inspired by a different region of Japan for these particular models. Uh, mm -hmm. Arashiyama Bamboo Forest, which is in Kyoto. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. too far, actually, from where they make spring drive, maybe a few hour drive. But, um, you know, this is uh, this is the time of year. It's basically the first frost into the end of winter, or the end of autumn, starting to, to get into winter. And the, the greenery is still very much alive, and it's one of the most popular times to go visit Arashiyama Bamboo Forest. So this is something that uh, serves as the inspiration. We have two different shades of green. There's accent colors in these models, obviously colors you would see in the bamboo forest. And then the dials themselves are linear grain. So it's a straight graining where um, this is 
expressive, I, I would say, of a couple of different aspects of bamboo, right? When you look at uh, wood bamboo or bamboo like a cutting board or something along those lines, very similar texture to what you see on the dial. But also the bamboo forest itself, when you're looking at, at bamboo uh, stalk after stalk after stalk, and there's hundreds, maybe thousands of them in this mm -hmm. forest, this is uh, the light kind of passing through these, these bamboo stalks. So really, uh, I mean, just a great concept. Uh, again, with the gold accents to kind of play off that light. And uh, silver dial is going to represent lights, where the dark gray dial represents shadow. So that is the, uh, the concept behind the models. Right. They are beautiful and uh, they're a great value. So again, 39 millimeters, so a very, very comfortable wearable size. But what's special about these is that they each come with an extra strap and a deployment clasp, correct? Yes. So that's, uh, that adds a lot to it. Uh, <laughs> that's for sure. The, the, the nice thing about this, you got a 39 millimeter, it's a three piece brush bracelet and 12.36. So for automatic spring drive, that's uh, about as, uh, as small of a case. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. on top of that, you get the strap and you get the, the cool accents and a nice textured power reserve. So there's a lot of like really great little points about these, you know, subtle uh, as, as all Grand Seikos are, once you get it under the magnifying, you know, this, yeah. uh, this is where you find the best parts of Grand Seiko. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they're great. And they're not limited editions. They're part of the regular collection. So we will see them uh, all the time. And uh, it's been, and what was the, the price point is, is amazing. How much thousand. are they? 5,000. Right, $5,000 even. Fantastic. Okay. Now, we are going to talk about something that I am very excited to see in the flesh. Um, and that is new GMTs. Yep. This this Great. is something I've been waiting for for a long time because you've had sporty GMTs before, but never in a 40.5 millimeter case like these are and never with ceramic bezels. So this, when these came out, uh, um, okay, put me down for the blue one. You know? Yep. <laughs> it looks incredible. Um, so so you've gotten to see these in person? Yes, yes. Uh, at least uh, at least prototypes, you know, which never mm -hmm. do the product justice. It's uh, It's a shame, but, you know. Sadly, it's just, you, you got to wait for the real thing to come in before you can really make the final call. Right. Uh, it, I think overall, everyone is really excited about these watches. The, uh, the size is great at 40 and a half millimeters, 200 meter resistance, got the crown at four o'clock and the bezel and the chapter ring make it actually seem smaller than its actual dimensions, which is kind of mm -hmm. cool. Um, and overall, I mean, the feel of the watch another thing that you don't get to see a lot of is this has a micro adjustable uh clasp so nice. it's like we use on on our chronograph you know with most grand seikos we're trying to keep the the, the clasp as thin of a profile as possible so it's mm -hmm. seamless with the bracelet itself and um you know fortunately we, we lose the micro adjustability so you can uh, manipulate it using the half links to, to get the right fit um, anyone that needs help with that, shoot me a note. I'm, I'm always happy to try and help you get it. Right. But um, the micro adjust is nice on this, and it's because, you know, this is uh, kind of got a heavier uh, cape, let's say. Right. Really more balanced using the bigger, bulkier clasp of, with the micro adjustment. So it ends up, uh, you know, it ends up really well balanced on the wrist because of it. So and I know people are excited to have a micro adjust on one of our bracelets. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, another little, there's two little details also that make this special. And I like to have diversity in a collection. So I like the idea of number one, having the crown at four o'clock makes it more comfortable and is just unique because a lot of watches don't have that. Um, and number two, what I love is that on the inner bezel, you have the odd numbers of the GMT hours. So, you know, you, you can see those other numbers on the inside of the bezel, uh, below the bezel, on the, uh, between the dial and the crystal. So that's a nice little touch, again, making it a little bit more different and something I think that's unique to Grand Seiko, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, I, what I love about the, the chapter in the inner bezel is the mm -hmm. day night. I just love yes. the tops blue and in the bottom silver. I think that looks great. Yeah, yeah. And it's like that light blue GMT hand on the blue one, especially. It looks really good. A lot of people going crazy for the green though. Here's that pro diver. So this is the 600 meter diver. It's mm. 40, almost 
nine millimeters wide, 16 millimeters thickness. And this is a very average seven inch wrist. It, it does not look a right. It's wearable. That's, totally. that's and you just got to try it, you know? Nice. So, so, um, when, and when are these going to be showing up? I believe what end of August? Yeah, hopefully it should be in by uh, end of August. I know uh, I know everyone's kind of going crazy for them. So, you know, we'll yeah. probably uh, – th that first allocation is probably going to go quite quickly. But, uh, you know, that's that's going to be the first shipment should be by end of August. Great. And it's uh, – the retail price is $6,200, right? Correct. Right. Amazing. Amazing price point. Well, we have 10 minutes left. So let's uh, take some questions. Um, so I'm going to start uh, just simple, um, and I'll go down with the questions in the box, but I have one that was uh, sent by my colleague's client, and he says, I see Seiko releasing vintage-inspired dive watches, but with standard Seiko movements of finishing, is Grand Seiko going to introduce any high-end versions of these vintage-inspired watches or anything vintage-inspired in a sport watch? Uh, you know, I would say that uh, probably not. I would probably. say I would say that's probably going to be a no, but uh, okay. it, it, it's a part of, I would say it's a part of like both brands history in in a sense, but uh, in reality, uh, that's better kept for, you know, for Seiko. Seiko. Oh, dive Absolutely. Water. Absolutely. You know, there may be influence because, uh, you know, uh, basically so, some of the designers, let's say from the past were, <laughs> who were greatly involved with the very, uh, you know, the very complex structure of our professional grade dive watches in, in the vintage era, we're mm -hmm. also involved with the Grand Seiko aspect of things. So, you know, there will be some tie, but. Great, great. That's yeah, thing. that's what I, that's what I figured as well. Okay, so let's go to the questions box I have. Uh, would you guys make pocket watches? There's never been a Grand Seiko pocket watch, so I would assume not. Okay. That's my. I, I would agree. Uh. Someone says, what, that was at the beginning, what mechanism does Grand Seiko use? But we, we've covered that. But I mean, basically you have, the, you have your regular standard um, beating at 2028.8. You have your uh, high beat 36.6. You have your uh, 9F quartz and you have your spring drive. Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, are Grand Seiko and King Seiko the same watch? No. no, no. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, hey, it's uh, King Seiko. When you're getting into the the vintage aspect of things, I mean, uh, King Seiko brand, um, but never, never quite to to the standard of Grand Seiko. I mean, that's just what separated Grand Seiko. So that's what right. the, was the big differential, especially when we introduced the the Grand Seiko standard. King yeah. Seiko had, I'd say, probably. Um, you know, a bigger focus on aesthetics. Still wanted to be a very uh, accurate watch, of course, but mm -hmm. was was more kind of driven on aesthetics. Uh, even though they had, a lot of the vintage models uh, have similar aesthetics, the DNA is, is shared a little bit, but right. from perspective, you know, and since there's no King Seiko today. Exactly. Grand exactly. Seiko is, uh, is, again, the, the pinnacle. Yep. And uh, last question. What does it take for a Seiko Presage piece to transcend to become a Grand Seiko watch? Well, I think we know that they're two separate companies and um, they're not really connected in that way. Grand Seiko has its own history and that they draw from. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it's just really two different forms of watchmaking. You know, Grand yep. Seiko, again, a higher accuracy standard across the board. Um, I know there's been some, uh, even though very small scale, uh, Passage Spring Drive introduced. Um, you don't have, obviously the decoration is one thing, um, right. not as high grade of a caliber, but in reality, um, the other big defining trait, I would say that, you know, you see this enamel dial, which is a very, very nice dial on the Passage. Um, you're not gonna have a pad, pad printed like that, it's uh it's not part of the dna they need the dauphin hands with the very highly faceted uh and perfect diamond cut mirror polished as aspects of it so there again the dna is just not there right great um so you were kind enough to share with me some uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna close our our hour here uh with this is the new studio that they built in japan yes 
Yes. So this is new uh, Ren Seiko Studio Shizuku Ichi. So Shizuku Ichi is, uh, you know, the Shizuku Ichi watch studio is where we formerly make all Grand Seiko mechanical calibers uh, mm -hmm. for some of the creator that they have in the Japanese domestic market. Um, so this is the new manufacturer that uh, has been under construction for about the last three years and uh, designed by renowned architect Tengo Kuma, who's also responsible for the uh, the new Grand Seiko flagship boutique in Paris and in mm -hmm. Paris. Um, so, I mean, just really embodies what Grand Seiko is all about, right? You can definitely feel the, the sense of nature uh, in this in this design. What's cool too is the peak that you saw on the outside of the building is actually pointing towards Mount Iwate. So oh wow, cool! It's like the symbol of mechanical Grand Seiko. So. Uh, there's actually two floors, and on the second floor of this new manufacturer, uh, you you have like a little lounge, uh, a little mm -hmm. shop, and a beautiful view of Mount Iwate. So that's a part of the design is to just have kind of a sit-in room where you can see Mount Iwate. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So well, that that is great. Um, so, <clears throat> any any parting words for everyone that you'd like to add? Joe? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I, I've always got, I, I've always got something to say, but uh, <laughs> I guess in this instance, no, not really. Uh, All right. But, you know, we look forward to uh, keeping things exciting. You know, the, the 60th anniversary of Grand Seiko is this year and, and uh, you know, it's not quite over yet, you know, so keep that in mind. Oh, so you're get, are you dropping a little hint there that there's more to come this year that we don't know about? I'm not saying anything like that. Wow, well, that is exciting. Um, and so uh, here we are, it's 4.55, we're gonna wrap it up. But I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. Uh, My pleasure. You, know, it's, you are uh, definitely, your brand curator is a fitting title thank because you. <laughs> you know so much off the top of your head. And for us here at Manfredi, we carry over 30 different brands and it is challenging to keep all the information at our fingertips. And so I love the fact that you have all of this information at your fingertips and that you're available to us and also to our clients. So if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, whether you're a Manfredi client or not, you're welcome to reach out to us via our website or uh, via Instagram here, any way you can get a hold of us. And you, if you have any questions about Grand Seiko, we will gladly answer them regardless. Um, I will help if needed. Yes. Well, I know I will reach out to you if, uh, if they don't. They don't. Uh, they don't mess around. They they know their product. That's for sure. Yeah. No. It, it's true. It's true. People really, really do know um, here. And uh, so uh, that's it. Thank you again, Joe Kirk, and thank you all who decided to join us for this hour. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Bye bye.